Welcome to Maximize Your Influence, your resource for the top persuasion, influence, and negotiation techniques that will help you maximize your success in life and business. And now, here are your hosts, Kurt Mortensen and Steve Olson. Welcome to another episode of Maximize Your Influence. I'm Steve Olson here with Kurt Mortensen, the persuasion guru of all time. How are you doing today, Kurt? Hey, I'm doing all right. Feeling good. How are you doing? Oh, doing fantastic. It's summertime. I'm certainly loving that. Taking a little bit of time off tomorrow and squeezing in a quick show with you here. So thanks for jumping on. Yeah, it's good to be here. I just got off the lake doing a little lake therapy, a little wakeboarding, so I'm feeling good. Lake, <laughs> lake fixes you every time. Yeah, that's true. You can get the tar beat out of you on that wakeboard and you're crashing. You know, a, a mediocre day at the lake is better than an awesome day at the office, I will contend, every time. I agree 100%. Yeah, I wish I could say the same about the golf course. I kind of decided this year, you know, I haven't been golfing once. And I've just decided that, you know, I've I've done it over the years just for the social aspect and to meet people for business. But the confession is, is I just really don't like golf that much. Am I a bad person? <laughs> no, I, you know, I, I golf. I used to golf a lot more. Well, last time I golfed, it was in Indonesia and a monkey stole my clubs, but that's a whole nother story. But <laughs> to me, it's like, okay, it's a nice day. I'll go to the lake, do I golf? And it's always like for me, I, I probably should go, golf more, but you're not a bad person at least. To, well, I guess to some of our listeners, you might have lost them forever. Maybe, maybe I did. But you know, if you have to say, I should probably golf more. That's kind of like saying I should probably eat better or I should probably spend more time with my kids. It's like you're doing it out of obligation or something. You got to want to do it, don't you? Yeah, that's probably true. It's one of those things that you really have to get into it. And you have to, and I think also too, the better you are at golf, the more you like it, as it's with it, probably any sport. The thing is though, on the wakeboarding now, you know, I've, <laughs> I'm not uh, any good at that, but I seem to want to keep going and, I just don't want to take the beating on the golf course that I'm willing to at the lake. <laughs> there you go. Well, uh, enough of that. Uh, our listeners don't jump on here to hear you and I chat about golfing and wakeboarding, as entertaining as that may be, right? We've got a couple of great things we want to talk about today on Maximize Your Influence. Once again, thanks for joining us. We've got a quick news item we want to cover. Always some entertaining things happening in the world of persuasion in the news as well as a couple of great techniques for you to take and run with after we get done with them today. But on a story on foxnews.com, I thought this was pretty entertaining. The title of the story, Kurt, is Bribing Among Airline Passengers Reaches New Heights as Seat Choices Get Scarce. I, I don't know about you. I'm just a lowly coach flyer. I think you probably fly first class, but it's getting pretty nasty back there in coach, isn't it? Well, we go back to that scarcity. There's not enough to go around. You might not get a big seat. You might have to sit next to that large person. And so that scarcity, especially on flights like Southwest, where a lot of the times the seats aren't assigned, and so it's first come, first serve, and that dramatically increases the tension. And, of course, if you're sitting by the aisle of the window, and then you really don't want somebody to sit in that middle seat. It's funny to watch people. They kind of spread themselves out, and they get their newspaper nice and big. Make it as make their face as mean as possible, hoping the person won't choose that middle seat. But I think that's <laughs> part of it too, is that urgency, that scarcity, and you own that little piece of the plane at that time. And if someone gets in it or crosses that line, people get really tense. Well, you know, these airplanes, the seats are so small. It's like a flying sardine can now. I can't tell you, I'm sure people will relate to this, how many times you're sitting on that middle seat during boarding, or you're sitting on that window seat, rather, during boarding, and the middle isn't taken. And it's winding down, most of the plane is boarded, and you see like 10 people coming down the aisle, and you're just going, I hope it's not that guy, I hope it's not <laughs> that guy. Because you know somebody's coming for that middle seat. Because there really aren't a lot of empty seats on airplanes anymore, the economy being the way it is fuel costing what it does. They've trimmed the amount of flights and it's filling everything up. That would probably be a great idea for some kind of a candid camera show is to just put a few hidden cameras on one of those window seats and just send these people down the aisle that are going to sit next to this person and see what their reaction is. I bet you'd get some pretty priceless footage there. I think it'd be a great getting a really, really large person that doesn't fit in the middle seat to try to get in the middle seat. Can you imagine them asking, can you put up your 
armrest. Well, I, I don't have enough room and see what people's reaction would be. <laughs> I need to fold <laughs> part of myself into your lap over there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, need, I need a half of your seat. Can you scoot closer to the window? Yeah, you could get guys that are just, you know, really smelly, rub a bunch of pizza or something. It'd be pretty good. <laughs> you need to put spinach in their teeth. Yeah, you just do the whole whole package. That's right. Hey, nobody take our idea for the uh, candid camera airline <laughs> seating idea. We're going to run with that one. But back to the story here. I'll read just an, an excerpt from it so people can kind of get the background here. But it says that getting the seat you want on a flight has never been more of a hassle. Last year, domestic flights in the U.S. were 83% full, the highest passenger load factor recorded since 1945. On top of crowded flights, most airlines have schemes in place to reserve choice seats for frequent flyers or those willing to pay a fee. Amid this atmosphere, some passengers are desperate enough to offer bribes to get their preferred seat. While not illegal or prohibited by the airlines, passengers exchanging bribes is a concern for some who say it will create chaos in the cabin. And there was a an interesting little excerpt down here at the bottom where it talked about a couple who got on the plane prepared these care packages, about seven or eight care packages to pass out to the people around them because they had a pair of 14-month-old twins. And it was their way of saying, we are sorry for what you're about to endure. <laughs> That's a good idea. I like that. Where other people are, they're getting angry, they're taking aggressive tones, somebody's sitting by somebody they want to be by and they won't switch seats because, like you said, they're already settled in, they've got their personal space established, and they're getting pretty grumpy about it. So airlines are having to figure out how to deal with this, and I guess we passengers are going to have to learn how to negotiate for better seats, not with the airline, but with our fellow passengers now. Yeah, I think it's going to get a lot worse before it gets better. Just because of the way they are, they are packing us in. We all have our personal space, that scarcity, and doesn't matter what they say over the PA on the airline there. People are going to get tense and uneasy in that situation. Yeah, yeah, it is a tense atmosphere. I just notice you tense up when you're getting on a plane. And I think everybody notices, too, that when it's time to board, logic and reason just completely goes out the window. Yeah, it doesn't matter what your zone is. It doesn't matter if they say... We're not boarding you yet. Please back up. They just crowd in. They crowd in. Even though they have an assigned seat on a lot of these airlines, people just go crazy. What's called that psychological reactance, that urgency. They got to get their space. They got to get their peace before anybody else does. Oh, yeah. Yeah. The primal nature, primal human nature comes out in in air travel uh, in, in all aspects of it, too. That's for sure. I have this theory that you know you can kind of tell by how somebody approaches their life by how they go through airport security. You just learn so much if you just sit back and watch them, how they unpack their bag or don't, and when they get to the metal detector. It's pretty fun uh, to observe that at the airport. <laughs> you can. You peg someone's personality pretty quick just by watching how they do that. Oh, yeah. It's funny because in business, you have to be no-nonsense and efficient, and, and you'll notice, and maybe this is because they just travel more, but business people, you know, they're taking out their laptop, their liquids and gels, I mean, they go through that thing efficiently, but some other people, they don't even know they're at the airport. <laughs> yeah, it's like they've never done it before. They haven't seen it before. Or like the person at the supermarket who starts writing the check after everything's <laughs> been rung up. You're like, really? You couldn't at least sign it ahead of time and put the store? Yeah. no. Well, we won't even go into the fact of, of somebody using a check at the supermarket. Uh, and, yeah, we won't go into that. We won't touch that one. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's not a <the> problem. <laughs> Well, cool. Let's do the persuasion blunder, shall we? You bet. Let's There's do it. There's the sound. Let's talk about the persuasion blunder of the week. One of the fun things that we get to do is we interview sales managers and managers, people that talk to persuaders and salespeople and find out what they like, what they didn't like. We get to interview top salespeople to find out what they're doing that the average one's not doing. And We'll just make up some names here to protect the innocent, but I was talking to Alan. Uh, he's a manager of a large company, and he talks to a lot of salespeople, a lot of persuaders, does a lot of negotiation, talks to a lot of outside people, and that's what he does. And I was talking about one of the his biggest peeves about talking to persuaders and negotiators, and this is what came up. And you have to be very careful here because this is taught in a lot of persuasion and sales training. This isn't a lot of books. 
it no longer works because persuasion and influence has changed dramatically. So rookies are sent in, and a lot of even seasoned professional people are sent in, and you're supposed to go into someone's office, right? You smile and you shake hands, and you'll look around for something to talk about. A fish on the wall. Is there a trophy? Is there a picture of the family? Oh, beautiful family. How old are they? Oh, do you fish? Where did you catch that? Wow, that trophy. What did you win? And people are tired of that. People want to get to the point. They see right through it. It has the opposite effect. That gushy chit-chat people don't like anymore. And so he had a couple of trophies he kept in his office, and he was just tired of talking about them. Eventually boxed them up and took them home because he was done. Every person, every rookie, every persuader, every salesperson, every negotiator would come and talk about the stupid trophies. And we don't think that through a lot of times because we're taught, oh, find similarities. Let's get a connection. Let's talk, find something to talk about. It's done. It's over with. People see right through it. Huge blunder. They need to know why you're there, what's in it for them, why they should care before you start trying to do your connectivity or talking about other things. That needs to be first, and that is a big shift in the world of persuasion and influence. So basically in this world today where where we're just bombarded with persuasion and influence techniques, tacky ones at that, almost all of the time, it's just increasingly important to show value right out of the chute. People, they don't want to spend that time talking. They want to know that you're actually going to be worth their time. After that, hey, they may be willing to talk about the trophy, but when people are are leading with it, then that's a total blunder. That's what you're saying, right? Yep. For most personalities and most situations, make sure they know there's value for their being there that's worth their time. And the big part of it, too, is so many people have done it. So many people have talked about the trophy. So many people have talked about it. Even though maybe the first 22 times they enjoyed it, they're right now they're, they're done because they've done it so many times and they see through exactly what you are doing. Yeah, it's not sincere. I guess if somebody could conceivably say, you know, hey, that fish, oh, you've been up to Alaska and they can relate a genuine experience and a, a genuine connection because that's ultimately what you're trying to do. I could see that as being effective. I was talking to a client yesterday who uh, I, I'm a big college basketball fan. And I found out that this guy went to the University of Arizona. The teams I like are all from the West Coast. And so we started chatting about that. And there was a real genuine connection there. We were enjoying the subject. He could get a feel for the fact that it wasn't forced on my part. And I think that's a big part of this for sure. And you hit it on the head here. That's the key. You knew something about it. It just wasn't a shot in the dark. Now, if I looked at the fish on the wall and I said, well, this is that kind of fish, and I've caught this off the coast, and this is the type of lure that I used, and I was on this kind of boat. If they know that you know and that you're part of it, then there will be a connection. But if you're just bringing it up, just bring it up, and you know nothing about it, then it will have the opposite effect. Yeah. So I, I guess the moral of the story here is if you can't speak sincerely about the fish on the wall, don't go there. Your biggest focus should be to establish value right out of the shoe. Exactly. Cool. Well, let's not make that blunder. Let's establish value right out of the chute, everyone. That's a good one, Kurt. Thanks for uh, bringing that up. You bet. Yeah. You know, it reminds me, (laughs) I used to watch It's Off the Air now, that show, The Office, and uh, the manager on that show, played by Steve Carell, is is known to be just a complete moron, a lovable moron. But, (laughs) you know, that's a lot of people got good laughs out of him being an idiot on the show, but he took another salesman out on a sales call with him once. And they go into this manager's office. They're obviously trying to sell him a bunch of paper. That was the product that they were selling. And this guy had a picture of him holding a fish. And the manager, he's going to show the trainee, this is how you do it. This is how you make small talk with these guys. And he says, wow, that is a really big fish. Where did you catch that? And the guy, he smiles and he starts talking about it. The trainee jumps in. He talks about how he caught an 80-pound shark off of Montauk in Long Island, New York. (laughs) Immediately assaults the ego of the guy and says, well, I caught a bigger fish. Not only did they go down the road of the blunder, but uh, they didn't pay attention to the prospect's ego very well. I I thought it was pretty funny being in the field that I'm in. I just say that's a great point. Uh, The first George Bush, he said something interesting. He says, you know, I never lost at golf when I was president. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> and that's the same type of thing. You don't want to top someone's story. You don't probably want to beat your boss in golf at least too bad sometimes because there are ego and esteem issues, and we'll talk about that when we get into the 12 Laws of Persuasion. 
Yeah, even if you did catch an 80-pound shark off a of Montauk, your prospect doesn't need to know that. Just keep that in mind. Exactly. <laughs> cool. Let's go on to what we want to talk about for the show today. We've gone over some good stuff already. We want to talk about proxemics. It relates a little bit to the airline story. What does proxemics mean? What in the world is that, Kurt? Well, we talked about the airlines, and we have our personal space. And it'd be interesting. You could test this next time you fly. Just kind of put your head on the shoulder of the person next to you <laughs> and see if that causes any psychological damage to them because we have our space. That's our space. And proxemics is the study of space. And it depends on the culture. It depends on how we were raised. But it's very important. Now, if you were to go into a negotiation and you took your chair around to sit next to the person you're negotiating with, that would be a violation of space. If you got too close at a restaurant or sat directly in front of them, that's kind of a violation of space because a little more confrontational. And it's interesting because, you know, here in the United States, on average, probably about like around 24 inches. But when you go to South America, it's about 16 inches they, they need to, as far as that space around them. So it's you get a South American and a North American talking. It gets really interesting. You watch them at a party, and if you fast forward it, the North American keeps backing up, and the South American keeps moving forward because they don't need as much space. And then you go to places like Germany, it's 28 inches. You go to places like the Middle East, a lot of those countries, they want to feel your breath, which would freak a lot of us out. You get no right or wrong here, but you violate someone's space. Just like a football coach would grab a football player by their helmet and yell at them, that's a violation of space. Sometimes you'll see lawyers do it to make people feel uneasy. But we have to be careful. You violate someone's space or even going to someone's home and sitting in their favorite chair or going to someone's office and moving things on their desk. We have to be careful of the space that people have. And if you violate it, you get too close, you move something, you touch something, you sit in that favorite chair – that's a subconscious trigger. It makes people very uneasy and uncomfortable and much more difficult to persuade. Yeah, it's going to put up those subconscious walls. So tell me this. Obviously, somebody backing up, that's a clear sign that you're in their space. What other body language cues or other cues should you look for to know that, hey, I've got to back off here? You mentioned the big one. If they're back, keep backing up, keep backing up, being aware of that. If they're folding their arms if they're sitting in a chair and they're kind of putting their feet underneath, they're trying to get more space from you, that might be part of it. If you need to move something or want to move a chair, at least ask their permission. And that would be one to take a look at. But you could see it in their body language, in their face. It makes them very tense and uneasy when you violate their space. How about the, the flip side? I mean, how do you know you should narrow narrow that space? What kinds of body language cues would you expect to see there? Well, just the opposite. If you move forward and they don't move back at all, that would be something. If uh, even you touch them and they didn't cringe or you scream, that would be one. And we, we can talk about touch here in a second. And that's when you know there's a connection there. Even if you you know touched them on the shoulder or you moved your seat a little closer and they didn't move back, would all be signs that there's a connection there and, and you're not violating their space. I've read that their shoulders are squared to you and, and their feet are pointing towards you, that that's indicating that they're receptive to the message. But if they kind of turn away slightly or their shoulders could be squared, but maybe their feet are pointing away or toward the exit, that's kind of a subconscious tell that, hey, I want to get out of here. I don't like what's happening. Is there any merit to that? It's right on. In fact, that's a great indicator of rapport when the shoulders are squared up and feet are pointing towards you. And those are two things that you can take a look at because if their shoulders aren't squared up with you or the feet are pointing away, you know that you don't have a connection. You know that they've they've tuned out and they might be ready to roll. You need to shift gears and try a different persuasion technique. Okay, good to know, good to know. So you brought up the concept of touch. That's really risky in today's day and age, you know, touching the prospect. I mean, when is that appropriate, if ever? Well, touch is an interesting one, and we're not giving you around permission to go grab people doing the whole football slap back in the workplace, although that would be an interesting candid camera like you mentioned before. But it's interesting, the studies that, for example, librarians who touched uh, just on the wrist got better evaluations, waitresses that touch get better tips. There's something about touch that connects us. And again, we got that proximic things, violating space, can we touch people? And some people don't want to touch culture, how we grew up. But there are some things that we can talk about. There's some safe places to touch people, the shoulders on the arm. But the one thing I think we can talk about safely, again, we're not bringing back the football slap in the workplace, is a handshake. 
Now, hope you're sitting down for this study, Steve, but here's the latest study is a bad handshake, which is touch, right? Handshakes touch. A bad handshake will set you back one hour in building rapport. So no cold fish. I mean, there's a long list of things, and people don't realize that there are a lot of complaints. There's the cold fish, the sweaty palm, the and you've had the too many pumps, the squeeze too hard, too limp. I mean, we can go down the list, and people don't realize that we should mirror and match the person's handshake. If I'm going to go talk to a CEO, I'm not going to extend my hand until they extend it first. If I'm influencing up, if I'm talking to a boss, and if they don't put out their hand, I don't shake their hand. Maybe they want to do the bump. Maybe they don't want to shake hands at all because there's nothing – Worse than putting out your hand and not getting a handshake. (laughs) So we have to look at the flip side as far as what is a great handshake. Well, first, mirror their strength. Make sure the finger is interlocked. Make sure your shoulders are squared up. There's good eye contact, two to three pumps. And we can spend time on this. But I think we all know a good handshake when we see one or when we feel one. But you can't adapt it to other people. It doesn't always have to be the same. But you need to be very careful because that is a form of touch in almost every culture. I found uh, on handshakes how somebody shakes your hand can at least get you a little bit of a read on their personality type. They turn their hand over the top of yours. They're really aggressive. It's kind of the driver type personality and, and the different variations that come along with that. What are your thoughts about that? Yeah, you can tell a lot about a person in their handshake. And you mentioned when they come up on top, that tells you a lot, especially if you're going to go talk to a CEO, especially with males. They're going to want their hand on top. It's a power play. They're probably not even thinking about it. It's something they do. And I just tell people, don't fight them for it. Okay, just let them have it. <laughs> I mean, if you're there to persuade, last thing you want to do is fight over the handshake. That's such a minor thing. But it is limp fish, the too many pumps, the way people treat you during a handshake. Is you one of your first indicators of pegging their personality so you can persuade them how they want to be persuaded? So, yeah, let that be a lesson to everybody. Let's uh, let's not turn this into an awkward arm wrestle where you're fighting to be on top and establish uh, who's in control. <laughs> yeah, you just, just let them have it. It's good. No big deal. Okay, cool. Cool. Anything else you want to tell uh, talk about with regards to touch? I, I was thinking about man touching woman, woman, man. What's what's the interplay there? <laughs> Well, again, we have culture issues. We have gender issues. We have corporate issues on the way we do that. Men touching men. There's a lot of rules there. A lot of things can happen there, but there's still some safe places to touch. Women touching women, there are fewer rules. Women touching men, there are no rules because we like it. Well, I guess there might be a few rules for some people, but I mean, there are certain things you need to be careful of. And some people were raised in families that didn't touch, that didn't hug, that aren't used to it. And when you gently touch someone on the shoulder, they kind of cringe or shake or scream. You know, that's not the type of person that probably wants to be touched. And you have to be aware of that, too, because... And that will have the opposite effect for you. Yeah, I guess if there's that generally open body language that we were talking about earlier, somebody's displaying that, there's a smile on their face, a true smile, you know, the smile that comes from the eyes. You can tell when a smile's fake, when just those muscles around the, the jaw are engaged, but when the eyes go along with it, it's a real legitimate smile. I think when those kinds of things are happening, the upper arm, the shoulder, those kinds of things, are probably going to be a big benefit. But if those things aren't happening, the risk is likely greater than any reward you would get from doing it. It is. Like I say, it it connects you. You're building rapport. It can have the exact opposite effect. If you're not careful, you do it too soon or you do it to the wrong person. Or or the wrong place. You could end up at the uh, police station instead of the police station. Yeah. Yeah. But maybe that's a challenge to our listeners to see if they can bring back the football slap, the rear end slap to the workplace. That's right. Yeah, you need to rewrite all the literature out there and call us or email us from the police station. We've got a great email address now, uh, maximizeyourinfluence at gmail.com. You know, we want to hear about it. Yeah, let us know. (laughs) Let us know how that worked out for you. (laughs) (laughs) Well, good. Good. That's going to wrap it up for today, everybody. Thanks for uh, listening to Maximize Your Influence. Any parting thoughts, Kurt? Take these skills, learn them, and go out and persuade with power. Great. We will talk to you next week. See you next week.